What is up guys? In this video we're going to be talking about CRISPR and CRISPR is arguably one of the coolest things to happen in biotechnology and bioengineering within the past few years. And before we talk explicitly about what CRISPR is, we're going to talk about why it exists in the first place. And to do that, let's first consider a prokaryote cell, a little thing like an E. coli. And these are pretty basic cells. They have a cell wall, they have a genome, and they've got some ribosomes, but uh, they are pretty simple. And these are unicellular organisms. And we as humans are very complex. We have eukaryotic cells, we have cells that have specialized to have immune systems so that when you get the cold, uh, your body can mount a response to that to help protect um, yourself. But in the case of prokaryotes, because they're so simple, they don't really have nuanced immune systems like we have with B cells and T cells and you know inflammation and all these other things going on. So if you're a prokaryote and you think about it, you are pretty vulnerable to getting infected by a virus. And um, if you're a prokaryote specifically, there are viruses called bacteriophages that will infect bacteria specifically. And when this happens, you are SOL if uh, you don't have an ability to uh, protect yourself. And so uh, bacteriophages will contain viral genomes. And what's going to happen during infection is that these bacteriophages have these little uh, tail sheaths right here that will latch on to the uh, bacteria, and then it will inject the viral genome, the, the cargo, and what usually happens within this cell is that if we were to uh, look at the viral genes, viral genome, uh, commonly what's going to happen is that uh, these, are, if it's going to be a lytic virus, it's going to immediately start uh, producing enzymes necessary to break down the host genome and kill the prokaryote immediately. And so what bacteria have evolved, what some species of bacteria have evolved is something uh, referred to as CRISPR. And the purpose of CRISPR is to uh, be able to detect and destroy the viral genomes after they've embedded themselves into the host genome. And so um, bacteriophages that undergo the lysogenic cycle, and I have another video on the lysogenic cycle, but the key point from that is that in the lysogenic cycle, a bacteriophage will incorporate its genes into the host genome. And after that has occurred, the bacteria, if they don't have an ability to remove or destroy the viral genes after they've made it into the host genome, is going to be essentially defenseless and it's going to get killed. So what uh, bacteria have evolved is a defense mechanism. And that was the original purpose of CRISPR. And what CRISPR is, is it's a combination between guide RNA as well as a protein called Cas9. And the purpose of the guide RNA is to recognize viral genomes after they've made its way into the host genome. And unfortunately, I don't have another color here right now, but what you can think of is if this was your host genome, which we know eukaryote, uh, prokaryotes have circular genomes, what happens when you have viruses in the lysogenic cycle is that you'll have these viral genes and these viral genes will kind of splice themselves into the host genome so that you get these little segments where this is the host DNA and you have a little section of viral DNA. And so the guide RNA will come along, recognize that uh, this recognize the viral DNA portions of the host genome and it will call over and flag the Cas9 protein. And so what the Cas9 protein does that is very important is it creates double-stranded breaks. And double-stranded breaks in DNA are very bad if uh, you want it to preserve the information that you have present. And so what occurs when you create a double strand of break in DNA is you've essentially knocked out a gene.
And so if Cas9 creates a double-stranded break within the viral DNA, it will have essentially destroyed the information within the viral gene, and therefore the unicellular prokaryote is protected now that the virus has essentially been killed within its own uh, cell. And so uh, this is why you can kind of think of CRISPR as like an immune system for prokaryotes. And so why is this useful to us human beings in research uh, when we're trying to modify cell lines? Well, we can create guide RNA strands that are specific for particular genes that we want to knock out. And so if you had a cell line and you wanted to see what it was like if someone lost the ability to create enzymes in glycolysis, for instance, like phosphofructokinase, you can create guide RNA strands that will be specific to the genes that uh, are involved in creating this process. And then because the guide RNA will stick onto it, you can also um, produce the Cas9 protein. So in lab, uh, to add some more background here, because Cas9 is a protein, you need to uh, translate some genetic material like DNA or RNA and actually make your Cas9 protein within the cell that you are trying to modify. And so commonly, if you buy a CRISPR kit from Thermo Fisher, uh, what you'll get is some guide RNA that'll be specific to what you want, as well as either mRNA for your Cas9 protein, and this will be mature mRNA that can be translated uh, by a ribosome to make your actual Cas9 protein, or you can buy the protein itself, which is generally a little bit more expensive because you don't need to even bother worrying about translating the protein in the first place. But the point is, you need the protein, you need the guide RNA. The guide RNA is what lets you target specific genes that you want to knock out, and that is how, how this whole process works. Now, there are uh, some other ways in which we can insert genes using CRISPR, but that will be a topic for another discussion. The key point here is that we are able to use CRISPR today in order to essentially delete or nullify genes that we don't want active within a genome of a eukaryotic cell. And so uh, taking all of this stuff, the Cas9 and the guide RNA, uh, and moving it from a prokaryote into a eukaryote was very challenging work that was done by Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley along with uh, other researchers within the past few years. And this is very exciting stuff. There are companies that are currently uh, working on products to uh, make use of CRISPR. But this brings me on to something that I would like to end with, which is the ethical dilemmas of CRISPR. And so the ethical dilemmas that we face as human beings when we begin to modify genes is that if we look at Darwinian evolution, look at natural selection, we know that DNA is not necessarily something that's perfect. There are going to be problems in it, but at the same time, we don't know if those problems can be solutions to problems that we don't even know exist yet. And a classic example of this is sickle cell anemia. Sorry. Sickle cell anemia. and malaria resistance. And so sickle cell anemia is a disease when your red blood cells take on uh, shapes that are not typical. They're not the little donut uh, with the hole filled in shape that we expect them to be. Um, and so we humans, as researchers and physicians and scientists, have defined sickle cell anemia to be a disease that we want to cure. You know, it's bad. We don't like it. So why not use CRISPR to knock out the defective gene that causes people to get sickle cell anemia? Well, the problem is that people who are carriers for sickle cell anemia are resistant to malaria. And because the red blood cells take on a very different shape and they have less surface area, 
the uh, the pathogen that causes malaria can't do its job as well and so uh, people who are carriers for sickle cell anemia actually don't get malaria and while it is fun to cure one disease like sickle cell anemia the problem that we run into is that we have just ruined a natural resistance to another disease which is malaria and this presents a whole host of problems and in my view it is very dangerous to start going around playing god essentially with uh, genes because life is imperfect science is imperfect and there are problems but it is what it is and life has made its way for billions of years based on these imperfections that are sometimes that <laughs> that have time and again in the past proven to be advantageous in situations that people never saw coming and this sickle cell anemia resistance uh, sickle cell anemia carriers being resistant to malaria is an excellent example of us being short-sighted in our approach to modifying genes and so um in labs so those are the ethical dilemmas you face in labs uh and then talking about what problems you face in you know execution of crispr if we were at a uh bench top right now trying to do this validation is one of your biggest problems how do you validate that crispr successfully uh, modified or knocked out a gene that you wanted it to knock out this validation step right here is very expensive and time consuming you can buy a kit to do crispr with for 40 bucks all right the actual thing to do this with to uh to buy the mrna that makes the cas9 protein and to uh, buy the guide rna to modify a e coli cell for instance is really cheap it's only 40 dollars but if you want to know and extract and develop and cell culture uh, cells that you verified have actually been modified by crispr it is very challenging and the question is why well these guide rna sequences that we're talking about are not that long um I believe they're about nine base pairs long and the problem with that is you're going to have guide rna that'll be specific to a nine base pair sequence of dna the problem is that human genome is three billion base pairs long and so how many times in this three billion ticker tape sequence of uh, nucleic acids do you think you're going to have the same sequence of nine letters you're going to have it in many locations i think this might actually be 20 base pairs which would make it a little bit nicer but um the problem is the guide rnas are not going to stick to the exact regions that you expect them to stick to because that same 20 base pair uh segment of dna is going to exist in multiple regions and the problem with that is if you have your guide rna sticking to different regions around your host genome your cas9 protein is going to be cutting in many areas that aren't what you intended to cut in and so this makes it very difficult for you to be precise uh, in your gene modifications and so the solution to this that you do in a biotech lab is to do this on hundreds of thousands millions of cells and hope that one of them actually had the guide rna bind where you hoped it to bind to and that your cas9 cut where you expected it to cut and that you were able to somehow isolate extract and cell culture that one cell that was successfully modified so validation is very challenging very expensive to do with crispr and it's a big reason why you know this stuff isn't as uh, widely prevalent today as we are expecting it to see so this is going to wrap up an introduction to the uh, fundamental science behind uh, crispr it is very cool stuff it is it has a lot of potential to help human beings uh, start doing a lot of very cool things with modifying uh, life but that presents its own set of ethical dilemmas and challenges with actually doing this stuff in lab and so i hope you guys find this useful and thanks for watching